Good morning, Century Meadows. Good to be with you again today. I uh, just want to welcome you to our worship service. Uh, first off, we have a few things that uh, I'd like to announce uh, for you to keep everyone in the loop as we are still unable to uh, meet in person together. A uh, few things uh, coming up here at Century Meadows. Uh, we will be having a men's golf, not men's, uh, men and women's golf tournament coming up soon. And so look forward for details on that. Uh, today I will be preaching, but next week we will have Jeff and Sonia Kilmartin, our partner missionaries uh, who have been serving in Cameroon. Uh, they will be with us and sharing God's word with us next week followed by one of our deacons tyrell herder is going to be bringing the message the week after that uh, next saturday or this saturday coming up is a wedding wedding bells are ringing for brandon peterson and arianne mickey so i hope that you are able uh, to encourage them in some way and we just uh, we will be praying for that couple and that marriage as it goes forth we are thankful that you are able to give and have given so generously here at CNBC. Uh, there's a lot of ways you can continue to give online methods or dropping checks off at the church. Thank you for your generous giving. Uh, it's been amazing to see how uh, just all the gift cards that have come in and, and your generous giving has been able to help a lot of folks in need in this time. And so thank you, church, for your response to the gospel uh, by being generous with your finances. Now, we, uh, as we approach worship, I'd just like to read a passage from Philippians 2. Uh, it was the close of last week. Philippians 2, 17 and 18 says this, But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. I pray that you'll be able to be glad and truly rejoice alongside our worship leaders this morning from your homes. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, before we start worship, we thought we would do some introductions because there might be some people up here that you don't know or haven't seen before. Um, so, all the way at the far end on the cajon, we have James. On the Lego bass guitar, we have Mike. On the acoustic guitar and vocals, we have Colby. Behind me is the lovely Rufan, who is on vocals and the synth board. Over here, we have Kate, who is rocking on the piano. And I'm Chantal, and I just sing. Um, so if you would join us in making some music today.
you so much for your singing, even though we couldn't hear it, I'm sure it was absolutely wonderful. Have a wonderful week. Thank you, worship team, and thank you for joining in worship, whether that was with pots and pans, a loud, joyful noise, um, or simply in your hearts. Um, I, at this time, would just like to uh, bring the needs of our congregation before our Lord and Savior, our one um, true sovereign God and King and the great healer. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we are thankful that we can be a church here in Camrose that is able to trust you because, God, you are faithful. Help us to continue to be hopeful and encouraged uh, in this time and help us to help us to truly trust you and seek uh, the ways that you are working in each of our lives and in uh, the life of, of your church here in Camrose. God, that we can be a people that uh, obey you and follow in your way really, really well. And God, there are many in our midst uh, with concerns that are uh, unlisted here today. We all have um, a great need, an ultimate need for you and your salvation this day and every other. And God, help us to help us to truly um, acknowledge you as our as our one true and great hope. And Father, we pray um, for Shannon as she had an unexpected heart attack. And God, we are thankful that, uh, Lord, you have already intervened in that situation in a mighty way. And we are seeing many, many signs of progress. Thank you, God, that you are uh, taking care of her and that family. Uh, Thank you for your your unexpected uh, joy and peace um, that is being experienced. God, we're thankful for little Michael, um, so many heart surgeries, and God, uh, he's still alive and well. We just pray, uh, God, that at this time, uh, you would continue to be with his parents, Brendan, Savannah, and the rest of the kids, and the extended family. Um, And God, we're thankful for uh, the progress that is being made there, and we just pray that you continue to heal uh, that young life, that young body, that God, we, he may grow Um, And we will see him grow and be able to participate in church and be a faithful servant of you. Father, we think of Carrie as well, um, suffering the the accident a few weeks ago. Uh, Lord, just continue to be with that family and continue to heal um, that body. And Lord, we are... We're thankful for many servants um, in this church, uh, one being uh, Dwight. But at this time, Lord, we we just pray that you would... uh, Help doctors to figure out what uh, this is causing, this autoimmune disease. And God, we just pray that uh, they would be able to treat it well. And God, ultimately, we ask that you would heal his body. Lord, we pray for Norm and for Faye and for Brian uh, as they continue a, an ongoing battle with cancer. Lord, we just pray that you would heal and that you would bring peace and comfort to all those families and those individuals. And God, that your light could somehow shine in this dark situation. And God, we, we give you praise that uh, Joanna, uh, her treatment went very well and uh, she is cancer free. And Lord, we give you the glory and the praise for that. And Father, we pray for Audrey as she is in the hospital. Uh, we pray for extra dose of wisdom for, for Volker and, and the rest of the family. Um, God, and for the doctors and everyone involved. Uh, Lord, that uh, she too could be healed and God be fully restored uh, to be able to be uh, with us again and also to uh, be able to come back home and live a a, a full and um, complete life. Lord, we we continue to pray uh, for our world affected by this coronavirus and Lord, we we trust you and we hope that we can learn and and go forward as as an even stronger church um, in your name in the future. Um, God, we just pray that they would find a cure, a vaccine, and pray that, um, yeah, all those lives that are affected, God, we are thankful that you care for each one, and you ultimately are in control, and you ultimately do. You have created each life, and you you offer salvation. Lord, we we pray for our missions outreach team as they discern uh, where... We, we spend uh, a big portion of our budget in supporting missionaries around the globe. Just pray for wisdom for them 
and that they would able, be able to uh, encourage our missionaries and that we would be able to support them very well, uh, even better than we have before, and that they could uh, wisely discern all the ways in which um, those relationships um, function and, and do well. Lord, we're thankful for the long-term partnership with Randy and Sandy Hubert, and God, we just pray that they would be able to continue to have fun and to persevere uh, in the very difficult uh, mission that you have before them. Uh, Lord, we pray that uh, you give them an extra dose of patience as they homeschool many teenagers. And God, we just pray uh, for your protection over them in their home. God, we are thankful that we can come to you uh, in this time and in every other. God, we, we are thankful for your faithfulness and presence with us. In Jesus' name, amen. So I uh, would like now to just show you this video. Uh, this is an update from Vern and Gloria Wagner, who are our partner missionaries in Romania at Camp Falcon Rock. It's been amazing to see the transformation, uh, the building of that camp over the last four years, and to hear some of the stories of God at work in, in lives of, of children and also in the lives of our partner missionaries in Romania. So check out this video. Hi, we're uh, Vern and Gloria Wagner. We're uh, missionaries at Camp Falcon Rock in uh, Romania. We've been serving there since uh, 2016. We're back in Alberta to do our home assignment. Um, with the COVID-19, um, it got bumped up. So we're back here for a couple months and uh, uh, this is our way of saying hi to our supporting churches. We've uh, been doing quite a few uh, rentals around the project. Uh, we've got uh, two brand new cabins up and running as of last June. Finishing off the, the two main cabins uh, was a big project that we had lots of help on and God has opened up so many doors for um, folks to come in. Um, this last year we had uh, 1,500 uh, campers and, and people, uh, young and old, come into the camp. And our next project is the main lodge which uh, have enough room for around 300 people to sit down in the dining room. So it's just going to be a huge addition to Camp Falcon Rock. So two summers ago, we were able to open the doors at uh, Camp Falcon Rock for, uh, I think we did three weeks of summer camp. And so that was great to see. And then this past summer, we were completely booked throughout the summer and did um, children's camps. We did youth camps. And it was so cool just to see all the excitement of uh, each group as they came in. And it was just awesome to see um, the work that God had done. The one of these little kids that was uh, there for the week, he come over and he was helping me pour the oil in and out of the of the lawnmower, and we changed the oil and and um, um, there was a there was a time when um, they had to had to leave um, to go back home, and uh, this little guy he come over and hung on to my leg because we'd made a connection, and uh, it's so easy to see how God was working at the camp that week and, and how he continues to um, even when we're not there. So we would like to thank our supporting churches very much for the prayers and uh, the financial support and because of you um, we have seen all these buildings being built but it's also exciting to see the leaders and the youth that come in to help out with the camps and uh, to see the growth in them and to hear their testimonies and the excitement in the youth to want to come back this summer and help out there also. That's the reason we're there is just to, uh, to spread the good news. So we just want to thank you so much. God's story, Timothy. So part of God's story is about a guy named Timothy, and it begins like this. A boy named Timothy, let's call him Tim, was living in a town called Lystra with his grandma Lois and his mom Eunice. These two women taught Tim about God. They also taught him to enjoy spending time with God, just like how you can enjoy spending time with your friends. 
Tim knew a lot about God and had heard that God was going to send his son Jesus to rescue people from all the wrong things in the world. But since there weren't any TVs or newspapers back then, Tim didn't know that Jesus was already here. One day, a man named Paul came to Tim's city and told the people there that God had sent Jesus to the world and we can know him and follow him. Tim wanted Paul to teach him to follow Jesus. He also wanted to learn other things Paul knew, like how to pray for his friends, how he could know God even better, and how to tell God's story. Kids, can you imagine loving to learn so much that you go to school all the time? You start following your teacher home on weekends and going with your teacher on vacation. You even go to school in the summer. That's kind of what Tim did. He followed Paul everywhere so he could learn new stuff about God all the time. But they didn't stay in one city. They went on a journey to a lot of cities like Corinth, Greece, Jerusalem, Rome, Athens, Phrygia, Galatia, Mysia, Troas, Neapolis, Philippi, Apollonia, Berea, Thessalonica, and back again. Have you ever taken a trip with one of your best friends? When you spend a lot of time together, you learn a lot about each other. Well, Tim spent a lot of time with Paul, and he learned so much from him. And all those things he learned, he started telling other people. Some people thought Tim was too young to teach things to grown-ups. But Paul said to Tim, Don't ever let people tell you that you're too young to tell them about God. You can show them how to act like Jesus. Kids, those things he said are in the Bible. 1 Timothy 4.12. Check it out. Remember, Paul knew a lot about God, and he was right. You're never too young to learn to act like Jesus. Anyway, in Tim's day, a lot of people were doing some pretty not nice things. Like some people tried to get their way all the time, or called their friends names. Others even did things like burp at the table right after their moms asked them not to. And they didn't even say, excuse me. Tim showed them how to act like Jesus. After a while, Tim and Paul couldn't be together all the time, but that was okay because Paul still wrote lots of letters to Tim, and Tim was able to keep learning. And even though Tim was still learning, he started to tell people about God. You don't need to know everything about God to tell other people about him, kids. Just share what you know. Now the problem for Tim was sometimes he felt scared. He wasn't afraid of the usual stuff. Spiders, dogs, darkness, heights, snakes, dentists, germs, even fluffy pillows. Or maybe that last one's just me. Where were we? Oh yeah, Tim was scared to tell people about God because he thought nobody wanted to listen to him. In his letters, Paul taught Tim that he didn't have to be scared of anything because God is with him. And you don't have to be scared either. God's with you too. Tim learned a lot of other things from Paul's letters too, like how we should always tell the truth, how we should make friends with people who are lonely, and how we should not be worried about looking cool or getting a lot of awesome new stuff. Remember, learning about God was Tim's favorite thing to do. So that's what he kept doing his whole life. And that's the story of Timothy. So in case you missed it, here's the quick version. Tim liked learning about God. He followed his teacher Paul all around the world and kept learning. He also showed a bunch of people what it looks like to follow God. Because Tim followed God, he wasn't as scared about things or worrying about stuff that didn't matter. And that's a part of God's story. So this week, um, even though there was a lot of demand for a praiser size part two, I'm going to spare you um, the physical exercise, but I hope that you will join with me for the next 20 minutes or so in some mental exercise. Um, this morning, uh, the sermon is titled The Gospel and BFFs. Now, if you are over 50, you probably do not have a clue what a BFF is. And if you do know, then that's amazing. Look at you go. Um, but if you don't, if you do not know what a BFF is, it means best friends forever. And it is a saying that teenagers often will uh, repeat and will verbalize in different forms. Um, but the thing about it is kind of the great irony uh, for teens and younger people or whoever, is they choose to pick a new BFF every week or every day sometimes. There's a lot of conflict in teenage relationships I have found, and even for adults, I think we do this too. So best friends forever. It's kind of a fun little bit of a play on words here, but at the same time, this morning's passage as we look at Philippians 2, we're gonna take a look at a couple characters, Timothy and Epaphroditus. 
uh, who were very good friends to the Apostle Paul. So the gospel, I think we have a good understanding of that, the gospel being the good news of Jesus Christ, his life, death, resurrection, um, and currently seated at the right hand of God, um, actually accomplish our salvation. We are awaiting his return with hope. And in the meantime, we participate in this kingdom life that God has called us to. So we're going to see how these two work together, this idea of, of friendship, uh, maybe even mentorship, how that works together with the gospel very well. A few big questions for us this morning as we dive into God's word is, do you have any truly deep and meaningful relationships in your life? Do you have a mentor in your life or someone who has mentored you in the Christian faith? What is our primary role as a Christian? Is it uh, does it have a consumer type bent or is it more of a participation sport? How do you truly view yourself and your current level of engagement in the gospel? We're going to take a look at some, some questions and some um, things throughout this sermon to help us identify kind of where we are all at in that. Now, as our restrictions have opened up a little bit, um, we are now allowed to meet with cohorts, and I heard a lot of good stories about people last week cohorting. This COVID-19 is bringing so many new terms into our world. Uh, people were cohorting and watching the sermon together and discussing it. And so I thought this week we would try something a little bit different. Um, it's uh, a little bit of a simpler production, but we are going to uh, work through about you know a small section of the passage and one kind of big idea, and then we're gonna hit pause, and wherever you are, with it's, if it's just your immediate family or with another family uh, that you are watching this service with, we'll pause and we'll have some discussion questions that you can discuss as we go along the way. And I, and I hope that you will do that, actually engage with the sermon this week. Let's pray before we dive into scripture. God, thank you for the opportunity to hear from you, to hear your word. This is an amazing truth. God, I just pray that you would um, speak through me, uh, speak to uh, your church, Century Meadows, this morning through your word. And God, I just pray that we'd be able to understand and apply what it is we hear from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So, last week, the salvation workout we talked about uh, the idea of fearing God, having a reverent fear of God, which should compel us toward obedience, uh, not out of a, you know, kind of an improper fear, but, but a, an awe and a reverence and a respect for God as the lion, not the fainting goat. Um, and, and this work of salvation, working out our salvation for Paul, um, justification is that event where we are saved. We are converted from um, our own way to Christianity. We are saved. Our conversion experience, that is our justification. And Paul uses that term in the past tense. When he talks about salvation, it's the present or future tense. Almost every time that he uses the word. And so the salvation workout, this is something we participate in. Our salvation, uh, it's not something we earn by what we do, but it is something that because of what God has done for us through the cross, we get to participate in the grace and in the gospel of our Lord and Savior. And so we were uh, challenged last week to consider how much we grumble, how much we complain. Uh, the, the text was clear, no more grumbling and complaining. How can we be unified as a church if there's grumbling and complaining in it? So how has your attitude been lately? What about your online presence? What kind of news are you sharing out there in the world in this COVID season? Is it uh, mostly news of a woe is me? Um, are, are, you, are you adding to the fracturedness that is already in our culture, dividing different political views or religious views? Or are you sharing a hopeful message of encouragement, one in which we're not we're not trampling on anyone, but we're actually working towards reconciliation or, or this work of redemption that God is doing in our world. So this morning, we, uh, with all that said, we are in Philippians 2, uh, verses 19 through 30. So I just encourage you to grab yourself a Bible and follow along with me as we read this text. Verse 19, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. 
I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. Verse 25, But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad, and I may have less anxiety. So then, welcome him in the Lord with great joy, and honor people like him, because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. So a few initial comments uh, here. So remember this letter that Paul is writing to the Philippians. This is a, a friendship letter. The church there in Philippi has been a great encouragement to Paul as they obey Christ. It's not perfect, but they are facing some pretty intense persecution, and Paul is encouraging them. They, when they found out that Paul, uh, their longtime partner in the gospel, Paul's a missionary that the church in Philippi supported, when they found out he was in prison, they sent one of their own, Epaphroditus, to deliver a care package of the N95, 65, whatever they are, masks and uh, soap and Lysol wipes. No, they, they sent um, likely money and whatever else that Paul would have needed. So Epaphroditus delivers this to Paul. He gets very sick and almost dies. And here we have Paul's uh, letter that he actually sends back with Epaphroditus, kind of explaining to the church in Philippi um, his reasoning for sending Epaphroditus and not Timothy, and, and how these two men partnered well with him in the advancement of the gospel. So first off, Paul, he had these two good men uh, in his life that he trusted as co-workers in the work of advancing the gospel. Why not send Timothy? Well, I think from this text, it's pretty clear uh, that Timothy was probably Paul's most trusted co-worker or soldier uh, in the gospel. Paul says, verse 20, I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. Everyone looks out for your own interests, not for those of Jesus. But Timothy doesn't do that. He looks out for the interests of others because of what Christ has done for him on the cross. So it's not that uh, Epaphroditus is, is a lesser human or something like that, but Paul, probably understanding the dangers of, of lengthy travel at those times, um, sent Epaphroditus back with this letter to the Philippians and, and wanted Timothy to stay with him. Remember, Paul's in prison. He's awaiting his trial. He doesn't know if he's going to live or die. And so having Timothy there with him, uh, one, to preserve his life, uh, is a is a helpful thing in the advancement of the gospel for Paul. Now, on risking life and limb to help a friend, um, there's a, an interesting analogy. So we, we learn in this text, verses 25 uh, through to the end at verse 30, Epaphroditus, when he delivers the care package to Paul, he gets really sick and almost dies. And Paul really feels for this guy. He has sorrow upon sorrow. Um, he, he hopes and, and is so glad that Epaphroditus doesn't die and actually God spares his life, uh, gives Paul less anxiety in that. Um, but at the same time, um, he, he really did risk life and limb uh, for the advancement of the gospel and, and out of his concern for the individual Paul, so that deep friendship. So the illustration came out in 2012 uh, when Hurricane Sandy uh, slammed against the northeast coast of the United States. This Category 2 storm became the largest Atlantic hurricane on record. Damages topped over $68 billion. At least 286 people were killed in the hurricane. Now, when the hurricane bore down on New York City, everything shut down. Well, almost everything. There was one rogue Starbucks near Times Square that stayed open. 
Now, desperate, probably highly addicted coffee lovers, <laughs> uh, fought high winds, dangerous rains, and dire warnings just to get a latte or a cup of coffee. Bethany Owings, age 28, walked 10 blocks with her one-year-old daughter for a fix. I saw on Facebook they were open, she said. It was scary not having Starbucks. Her neighbor and her friend, 29-year-old Chris Hernandez, came along later said, when she said they were open, I was like, pack the baby up, let's go. I don't know, I don't know they were all going to close. I started panicking. There's nothing else I would have gone out for, he said. This makes my day complete. Alex, uh, age 25, similar scenario, walked over half an hour through wind and torrential rains uh, just to get his pumpkin spice latte that he could get nowhere else. So that's a humorous illustration of how far some of us will go. We will risk, well, they actually re probably really did risk their lives to get a cup of coffee. That's crazy. I really like coffee a lot, probably too much. Uh, I don't think I'm willing to risk my life for the sake of coffee. However, kind of the, the point of this story is how far are you actually willing to go to risk your life for the sake of your friends? How about for the sake of the gospel? How much are you willing to risk for the sake of the other? Paul, Timothy, Epaphroditus, they all sacrificed, sacrificed everything in their lives for the sake of the gospel. Their response to God's grace was not a mere mental assent or a belief. It was actually a wholehearted, committed um, um, action in that they lived out what they believed. We're going to do a little bit of introspect throughout this sermon. That means basically examining yourself and kind of trying to self-identify where you're at uh, in regards to some of these, these larger questions and issues. I'm going to give you a scenario. Now, Paul, he trusted Timothy and Epaphroditus and others to deliver this highly important message of the gospel. Now, these are the days when Paul couldn't just you know, text uh, Timothy, say, hey, what's up? What things are you going through? Um, what's going on at the church there? He couldn't do those things. It'd be lengthy weeks and months of travel. He'd encourage folks, uh, send them away with the gospel message and, and often a letter. And they were called in that church, that place, to pastor well and to call people to the gospel and to uphold the truth. Basically completely disconnected from Paul for the most part. So they had the gospel, they had the spirit with them, uh, they didn't have a lot of other connections. So here's a scenario. Could you be entrusted by Paul to bear witness to the gospel in a place that was hostile to the gospel without Paul's help? Could Paul entrust you with that message? Are you that committed to the gospel? Are you that skilled? What would need to change in your life in order for you to be able to be trusted with that gospel message and for you to take it seriously enough that you'd be willing to risk life and limb for the sake of the advancement of the gospel? Paul mentored Timothy and Epaphroditus. We have evidence of this. He entrusted them with the gospel message. Could Paul trust you with this infinitely important message? So I hope that you did take the time to discuss uh, that question um, and just acknowledging uh, within ourselves and just being true to ourselves uh, and to the gospel, how far would we go? What would we risk for the sake of another or for the sake of the gospel? Or are we far more focused on a lot of other things in our lives? Second main uh, idea or issue here in this, this text is the need to see people rightly. I think this is a huge, huge issue for all of us in our lives, uh, especially in the church. Now, if we take the big picture of this letter to Philippians into, into context here, um, Paul, yeah, it's a friendship letter, a lot of encouragement. Uh, he's spurring them on, as it were. But there's also a little bit of divisiveness there in the church. He speaks to unity, humility, uh, and against disunity several times in this text. 
So to remedy this divisiveness in the church, Paul says, um, to kind of recap the first half of Philippians, the best way to, to fight against disunity, dis divisiveness, is to squelch any selfish ambition or vain conceit. That is our own deal. At each of us as individuals, we need to look into our own hearts and lives. How much selfish ambition is coming out of me on a daily basis? What about vain conceit? Am I out there to get mine and make sure I, I um, you know, uh, make sure I put myself above others rather than valuing them as a fellow human being? Secondly, uh, in Philippians, uh, we're called to cultivate a spirit of unity and humility. So how humble am I? How much do I work towards unity in the church, outside the church? And am I willing in this text to put the interests of others above my own? And we do this uh, because of the cross of Christ. Now, anyone that becomes a Christian is justified. Part of their salvation, working that out, is to live out this grace that was extended to us. Now, there's some people in this world, they just, they just seem to get it. I don't know what it is. The cross of Jesus, they, they think about it and they're brought to their knees. They're brought to tears. And I think that is one of the only right responses to the salvation that's offered to us. Um, what, once we understand what Christ has done for us and what he's saved us from and saved us to, uh, we can't respond in any other way but worship and, in hum and humble service to him, to obey him. And so when we do this, a huge part of it is what Paul is hitting home here in Philippians. Partner with me in the advancement of the gospel. That is what he's saying. Continue to do it well. Here's some ways you can do it even better. Now, Timothy and Epaphroditus, they're, they're examples of some really good um, followers of Christ that Paul is highlighting in this letter. How is it that they seem to get it? Well, they see people rightly. They see other people's interests above their own because of what Christ has done for them. What does this result in when we actually understand grace, when we truly get it? This results in us or our love for one another in the church, number one. And it involves us having real relationships with one another in the church to the point of uh, being BFF's best friends forever. Or another way of saying that would be having some deep and meaningful mentorship relationships. Who is someone that is encouraging you in your faith? Who is someone that you are going to to ask your deep, hard questions? Uh, the longer that I am a pastor, the more I know for certain that everyone is struggling with something. Life is really hard. Who are you currently going to for advice, for help? Are you venting that in inappropriate ways on social media? Uh, when you gather with your friends, is it a constant, never-ending, um, negative, kind of bitter, bashing session of everything going on in the world? Um, we need to have a few of those relationships in our lives where we are reminded of the gospel and the beauty of it. We are called to joy and peace and love for each other and, and for God's church. And we cannot do that if we are seeking our own selfish ambition, if we are looking out for our own selfish interests. If I'm looking to my selfish interests, I am saying, yeah, everybody out there is doing it wrong. I'm doing it right. And folks that are bitter, uh, folks that uh, do a lot of venting and complaining, uh, inappropriate conduct on social media or whatever it is, folks that work towards disunity, they, oh, I, at the heart of it, I think it's a misunderstanding of grace. I really do. And so I would encourage you, look to the cross. Look to the grace of Christ to help you correct this in your life. I look to the cross to help me correct this in my life. Now, if you do not have any of these deep, uh, meaningful relationships in your, in your life or a mentoring relationship, I think here's where the rub kind of happens for people. Um, it, something just breaks down. We're Christians, yeah, we're happy-go-lucky. It kind of becomes a superficial, almost a fake uh, kind of way to live for some folks. And it, break down, it breaks down at this point. Here's the litmus test, okay? The litmus test for your own life. So in your world, in your life, do people that you meet, do they have a soul? Do people in your world have souls? Matt Chandler asks this question on a book he wrote on Philippians. And he asks us to examine, um, you know, when, when we're at a restaurant and we have a waiter, how do we treat them? If we treat them very poorly and are critical um, and 
are, uh, are mean even to them or even short or even ignoring them to some extent, does that person in your mind have a soul? Because he really does or she really does. What about a family member uh, that you have a hard time getting along with? Do you objectify that person, um, trample on them, ignore them? Or does that person have a soul? Do you treat them with dignity and respect? What about your coworkers, your boss, your, your soulless, heartless boss? We can't look at people this way as Christians. People have a soul and they matter. What about your kids? What about an ex-spouse? What about other church members? What about Christians in other denominations? Do we treat them as fully human, as creations of God, as image bearers of Christ? Or do we treat them as objects? Now, I don't know about Maple Leafs fans or Flames fans. I'm uncertain if they have a soul. I'm joking, obviously. I don't know that God created Maple Leafs and Flames fans. That's like part of the curse of the fall, I'm certain. Um, no, I'm joking. Every person has a soul and we are called to treat people well. The only way we can do it is if we understand grace. If I understand that I'm a sinner in desperate need of saving, there is no way I can go around treating people poorly just doesn't work. Because of what Christ has done for me, I am called to look um, to put others' interests above my own. The good news, friends, though, is that folks like Paul, Timothy, Epaphroditus, they didn't do it alone. Um, they had uh, deep and meaningful relationships, this text would suggest. Paul talks very, very fondly about Timothy. He has no one else like him um, who has genuine concern uh, in the gospel with him. Now Paul's concern for Epaphroditus' well-being almost takes it to, to another level. Paul, um, in this relationship with this messenger, Epaphroditus, he, it's not superficial. Paul actually acknowledges that, that Epaphroditus' sickness um, and almost dying, that really affected him. He, he's thankful to God that he was spared sorrow upon sorrow that Epaphroditus ended up being okay. And, and Paul talked about the anxiety it caused him when he was not doing well. When we have these deep and meaningful friendships uh, with other Christians in the church or with people outside the church, we truly care about them. And it doesn't mean it's all happy-go-lucky lucky and kind of fluffy stuff that we talk about. Uh, it's the real deep you know, meaningful, messy stuff that we actually engage in together. What are your deepest struggles? Uh, it hurts me when I see you hurting. How can I help? Uh, these relationships are characterized more so by that mentality. So do you truly care about those folks um, in our church, fellow CNBCers, uh, who partner in the gospel together? And sometimes for us, uh, we just simply need to see our blind spots. A mentor can really, really help that uh, in, a, in a huge way. I have people I go to um, and I ask them to, you know what, like what, um, where can you see that I can do better as a pastor? I have people I go to to ask that question. I have people I go to and talk about uh, areas where I'm falling short and they can encourage me. They can hold me accountable. I hope that you do as well. So take this time uh, and just examine uh, this next question and discuss with the folks you are watching this sermon with. Discuss the, let, the litmus test. Do people in your world have souls? I hope so far you haven't been too dismayed uh, to the answer of the question, uh, could Paul trust you yourself uh, with the advancement of the gospel, with the gospel message? And do you see people rightly? Do people in your world have souls? Uh, when we're convicted by God's word, the only appropriate response is to try to just work on it. Uh, worship God, uh, fall in line with what his word says and uh, humbly obey his word and we get to do it together and it's called working out our salvation it's called sanctification uh, and it's a beautiful thing when we do it well together thirdly uh, this morning 
our culture really pulls the church into the allure um, or the temptation even or the reality of consumerism. Now, we need to avoid uh, becoming a consumeristic church at all costs. The consumer church uh, basically would be, um, we, we would look at attending church to get something from it. We would, uh, you know, be very critical of everything that goes on and all the programs and all the stuff. Um, and just and we would want the church to meet our needs and our thinking of how Christianity ought to function. Um, that is in no way how the church ought to function and how you ought to view uh, the church. We are called to participate in the church. We are the church. The church isn't institution to cater to our needs. Um, it is a group of people that together who who understand the gospel, they see people rightly, and together they are trying to advance the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, by putting others' interests above their own. It can be a beautiful thing when done well, but the consumer church is a very, very ugly thing that is leaving a bad stain on the, the North American church. Now, Timothy, Epaphroditus, and Paul, they all understood uh, that Christian commitment means losing one's life in order to find it or forfeiting the whole uh, world, uh, but gaining their soul, in the words of Jesus. So our primary role as Christians is to understand just that claim, that our, our primary purpose in this life is to seek a life in participation with God, in loving Him and loving other people. That's how it breaks down the simplest. Um, advancing the gospel or being a messenger of the good news is, is simply another way of saying that. They all work together. So our primary role is not to consume, but to participate. So I'll challenge, um, challenge you with this illustration. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German uh, Christian and pastor, and a very well-known theologian. Now, he um, lived in Germany, and it was 1939, where uh, you know the World War II was uh, on the we were on the cusp of World War II, and Bonhoeffer looked at this situation that that German Christians were were in. Uh, they were being forced into the military, forced to comply with uh, the ideals of the Nazi regime, and Bonhoeffer he just he couldn't in his heart of hearts comply with that, and so he was trying to to garner up some support for the German Christians by coming to America and telling the story of what's happening in Germany. Now, while in America, of course, Bonhoeffer being a brilliant mind, he thrived. Uh, people seemed to be clinging to his every word. They wanted to keep him in America. Um, he, he had a dilemma, though, which soon, um, soon began troubling him. Uh, if he were to stay in America and, and the church in Germany, the Christians in Germany, um, you know, if they couldn't rally and, and speak out against this Nazi regime, then surely um, the Germans' victory in that war would mean a very, very costly blow to civilization and to Christianity itself uh, in Germany. On the flip side, Germany's defeat, so you know his countrymen losing that battle would mean the survival of civilization or even possibly the survival of Christianity in Germany. So Bonifer was torn. Uh, he knew he had to return to Germany. At the end of the day, uh, after searching his heart, he, he could not stay safely in America and, and inspire people from there. So he goes back early in the war and starts up an underground seminary, so to speak. So um, kind of secretly is gathering young um, church leaders in Germany who are faithful to the gospel, and he's teaching them, and they're doing their best to encourage people and protect uh, Christians and protect Jews from the Nazi regime. Now, Bonifer could have stayed in America and done the simple or the safe, secure thing, um, if the gospel he believed in was about him, if the church he participated in was a consumer church, he would have said, ah, you know what, God does want me to be secure and safe over here. This, these other people, they don't matter so much. They don't have a soul, perhaps. Now, that is just a, a little example of the dangers and the, almost the evil of the consumer church mindset. Bonifer goes back. 
There's no way that he can live uh, with himself as a Jesus follower and do the wrong thing in that scenario. He goes back to Germany. He eventually was executed, executed by the Nazis in 1945, only 21 days before the collapse of the Nazi regime. And so Bonifer uh, literally risked his life, gave his whole life to the truth of the gospel. He wanted nothing more than for the Christian church in Germany to thrive, for an evil empire to be stopped, and for, for God to have his way in that nation. So in light of the examples we've had this morning from our text in Philippians 2, or, or from Bonifer himself, let's imagine a church where um, living in the same way as these gentlemen was the norm. Imagine if all of us who called ourselves Christians served Jesus and obeyed him to the extent that the Pauls and Timothys and Epaphroditus's and Bonifers did. Imagine what Camrose could look like. Imagine what Century Meadows would look like. Did these gentlemen have problems in their lives? I guarantee you they did. I guarantee you they did. Um, but at the same time, they also understood that living a life where your primary purpose is to advance the gospel, to seek others' interests above your own, and not to cling to your life or what you want um, above the gospel itself. Those are our primary purposes. They got it. They understood grace and they lived accordingly. When we participate in gospel advancement and refuse to be consumer Christians, our very lives tell a very powerful story about, Je about Jesus, regardless of our circumstances. So, a little time for some introspection yet again. Just be honest. Do you think more about what the church can do for me and my family than you do about what I can do to participate in these people whom I call the church? The same is true, friends, in any other organization we're involved in in our communities. Do we look to our sports clubs to see what they can do for me and for my kid? Is school, is public education about, oh, what can they do for my kid? How can my kid be the best? Um, or do you see it with more of a gospel mindset? How can I participate and help out these teachers and, and these schools so that all kids can flourish and prosper? Do your children's friends have souls? Or, in your world, do they not? Are they objects? Do you want your kid to rise above? And I'm not saying we don't want what's best for our kids. We do, but we need to see all people rightly. Now, um, just take some time uh, to discuss uh, this, this question of um, do we have this consumeristic mindset in our lives and in our church? I hope that you have enjoyed uh, your discussions and that they have been fruitful this morning. I always encourage um, everyone I speak to um, to engage with the actual sermon. I love to hear feedback. I love to hear when people are gathering together, uh, being inspired and encouraged by God's word and also having it convict and change their life so that we become more like the Jesus that we proclaim. Now, in conclusion uh, this morning, uh, pastor and theologian Don Snookian has this, um, this illustration or this um, way of telling this story that we have just talked about here in Philippians 2, 19 to 30. You know, he tells a story from the perspective of a jailer who was chained to Paul for, for six hours at a time per day, and they would rotate through. This was common in Roman prisons. And um, Paul would continually tell these stories, uh, story after story, about how, you know, he's in a win-win situation. If he lives, it's great. He wins. It's amazing. He gets to proclaim his king and serve his king. You know, a Roman soldier, jailer, would probably understand that. Yeah, we kind of serve our king, but king's not that great. Um, and Paul would also, the second part of that was he didn't actually care if he died. He really didn't. To be with Christ was better. So this was truly a win-win. And the jailer did not understand this aspect of it at all. Furthermore, when you know, folks like Timothy are at Paul's side and Epaphroditus is risking his life um, for his friend Paul and for the sake of the gospel, the jailers really don't understand this. 
Um, and Sanukian writes um, that the jailer speaks to Paul and says, we do not have men like that in our kingdom. And Paul responds and says, that's true, but you don't have a king like we have. I pray that you truly, uh, in your cohorts, in your lives, in your family, would truly look at the cross and truly understand what kind of king we serve. A king that will humbly lay down his life for our sake. We are called to reciprocate that as the church, as the body of Christ. We are called um, to show this world what God's kingdom is truly like. A kingdom of unity, of love, of peace, of humility, where we do not look to our own interests, but to the interests of others. Let's pray to close. Heavenly Father, God, we're thankful for your word. God, give us the courage above all to acknowledge uh, areas in our lives where we fall short, areas where we need to allow your truth, your gospel to change us. Help us to change. Help us to obey you. Help us to uh, live our lives together as a church, as Century Meadows, that shows our community uh, what you are like, the goodness of the gospel, the goodness of who you are, the goodness of your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, uh, CMBC, this week as you acknowledge the self-sacrifice and the service required to participate in the kingdom of God. Have a wonderful week.